and thank you to my panelists. Um, this is gonna be a great hour of really important conversations about the opportunities to create a port of the future for CBP and talk about supply chain security risk management. My first questions will be directed to my uh, esteemed colleague, former boss, Mr. Overacker. And um, I, sir, I would like for you to, to just give you a minute to talk about what is the current state of play at CBP in terms of the ports of entry and as it relates to the resumption of trade and travel for all of you. Well, Liz, uh, thank you for that question. And, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I hope you are all safe and well. So with respect to how things are operating at our ports of entry, uh, there are a lot of things that are going on right now. So first of all, let me talk about the trade aspect of this. Um, you know, in March, April timeframe of 2020, uh, we saw huge declines in the overall volume of trade coming into the United States as a result of COVID. Uh, we saw declines as much as 30 and 40% respectively in those two months, but trade has essentially come back since then. And because uh, the cross-border trade is considered essential, it has not been impeded in any way, shape or form by COVID. And as a matter of fact, for fiscal year 21, which just concluded at the end of September, you know, we actually processed $2.8 trillion worth of imports, collected over $84 billion in duties, taxes, and fees. And those are both both of those numbers exceed pre-COVID levels. So trade continues to move. And, and just one other anecdote, on the Southwest border, where we have the most intense volume of trade, truck traffic is actually up 10% over where it was pre-COVID levels. Now, uh, I know that there are supply chain disruptions out there, and people want to ask about that, uh, it's particularly what's going on in LA Long Beach. And I can just, I just want to say this, that what we're experiencing there or what the entire nation is experiencing there with respect to supply chain disruptions is really part of the full breadth and width of the domestic supply chain uh, from availability of truck drivers, whether it's long haul truckers, uh, rail crews, availability of chassis to move uh, containers out of the seaport. So the delays are not really occurring at the water's edge itself. Uh, we at CBP, we use advanced electronic data to assess risk prior to arrival. We allow those vessels to immediately discharge cargo. And we're operating 24-7 in the LA Long Beach Seaport so that we can be as efficient as possible and not contribute to that supply chain disruption. But that disruption is really a byproduct of many factors in the supply chain beyond CBP's control. The other thing I just want to talk about when you asked about resumption, uh, of course, last month we did resume normal uh, operations for travelers, uh, both air travelers and land border. And what we've seen since the resumption of travel is that we've actually seen a significant increase, uh, over 50% increase in the number of travelers coming to the United States. Um, as of right now, our travel numbers are about, in the air environment, are about 41% of where they were pre-COVID, which sounds like a low number, but in April of 2020, we were down um, at only 1% of where we were pre-COVID. So travel is coming back and we're able to manage that. Wait times at airports are, believe it or not, only 20 minutes. So people who are traveling internationally uh, are being processed at our ports of entry. Uh, and then the last thing I just wanna say with the resumption of travel, in particular for non-essential travel on the land border, of course now uh, travelers can come to the United States uh, we have a lot of great information on our website that explains that process. But, but to do that, you have to be vaccinated. And there are specific vaccines that are sanctioned by the, uh, the World Health, Health Organization that are recognized by the CDC, that if you have those vaccines, you, that, that qualifies. We also make certain to remind people that before you travel, make certain you have a witty compliant document, a, a, which is a Western Hemisphere uh, travel identity document so that you can present that. And then when you do come, uh, you, will have, you will be asked to state the intent of your travel so we can determine whether it is essential or non-essential. And then based on that status of the travel, we may ask you to provide proof of your vaccine, vac vaccine status. And what we've seen on the land border right now is that wait times are about, are about 58 minutes on the Southern border, 
but only two minutes on the northern border. So we're, we've seen this resumption of travel and it's going fairly well right now. The last thing I wanna say, and I don't mean to, to take up too much time Liz, but come January 22nd, it is anticipated that the exemption, of, that the vaccine requirements will apply to essential travel as well, which means truck drivers, rail crews, uh, brokers who have runners that bring uh, you know, customs documents across the border, those folks will also be required to be vaccinated, but that's gonna be coming up next month. Okay, thank you so much for that. So to get sort of to our topic, I think it's really important to take opportunities like this to, to sort of message where CVP is. It's very confusing in terms of kind of what you hear or don't hear on the news. So I really appreciate that update. Um, the second question and, and to our topic today is uh, the port of the future. And, and I'm really interested for you to be able to tell us what CBP is doing in terms of the development of the port of the future, both in the land border um, arena and at the seaports. All right, thanks for that, Liz. You know, it was back in 2016 when we were approached by leaders in Donna, Texas, uh, asked about building a new cargo facility there on the, on the border with Mexico. And it really was an opportunity for us to take a clean sheet of paper and put down on it what we thought would be the best way to manage cargo traffic at that time, that's what we were talking about, cargo traffic uh, coming into the United States. And the, and the whole idea then was, let's turn the port around and let's, you know, think of it you know, like in the airport environment where you grab your bag, you know, bags first, is, which was an innovation that we had here at CBP a while back. But this same, so scan first was the idea, the idea to use existing scanning technology, which had advanced tremendously over the last decade uh, but put it on primary or pre-primary and, and increase our scanning rates. So that was the first concept. The second concept was uh, to have drive-through technology so that we could do this without stopping the vehicle whatsoever. So use low energy on the cab of a truck, high energy on the trailer of the truck. So that was the concept of drive-through systems at primary and pre-primary. The second part of that is to integrate that piece the scanning piece with all of the other technology that we use at the land border for processing trucks, whether it's the RFID indicators that we use to assure that we have the user fees paid, whether it's the use of license plate readers to match that particular truck with the manifest that we have in ACE, uh, uh, and also the, the use of facial recognition. We had already begun using facial recognition in airports uh, to capture biometric entry and exit, but why not use facial recognition in that truck environment where we can capture that driver's face and then link all of that together in a single viewing platform and feed that to a command center where we can that can be supported that can support remote operations and from that command center we actually control the flow through the port the idea being that once that truck gets to a primary they'll either get a red light or a green light and then they can keep moving and, we, and that was in 2016 where we put that idea on paper. But right now today, we have a fully functioning uh, model port that we've created in Brownsville, Texas, where we're applying all of these technologies. And I'm gonna tell you, it's quite remarkable. We see these trucks flow through the port right now, and we're scanning roughly 80% of everything that goes through there. And just through the normal throughput of, that, of the trucks, how they move through a port of entry, we're able to adjudicate those scans and keep those trucks moving without stopping. And so we've actually, uh, we've actually heard anecdotally from truck drivers who make multiple trips a day, that they're actually able to make more trips a day in Brownsville than what they had in the past. So that working model is up and running. And Congress gave us money in FY19 to expand that across the Southwest border. And this past year, we awarded contracts in excess of $430 million for the acquisition of new drive-through equipment that we are now in the process of deploying at 25 locations on the Southwest border. So, so this port of the future concept is rapidly becoming the port of the now. We're also applying this to seaports in the sense that we have a working model in Savannah where we have similar uh, technologies in, in place, drive-through systems, uh, feeding into a command center. And from that command center, we're actually able to control the exit gates of the seaport complex. And so that will be the next step. Besides the land border, we'll be applying this in seaports around the country. 
That's awesome. I'm thrilled to hear that. And, um, you know, I was, uh, I was around when we were discussing that as the art of the possible. So congratulations on making so much progress. Um, and the last thing I wanted to touch on was, you know, CBP has the largest public-private partnership in the world for supply chain security in CTPAT, the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. And um, my question really is, are there opportunities that you see to leverage those partnerships in support of this kind of innovation that you're doing? Well, yes, and, and um, thank you for asking about the CTPAT program, Liz. Um, nobody knows it better than you. Yes, it is probably the largest public-private partnership in the federal government, and it, it is a showpiece for CBP, and it is the, the standard bearer globally. And so, you know, besides the work that we've been doing over the last three years with respect to updating and implementing our new uh, minimum security criteria, you know, we've been working with the World Customs Organization on the safe framework of standards to integrate some of those new innovations that we have there. And of course, we're working with our mutual recognition partners uh, uh, that we, with whom we have arrangements to implement those standards there as well. In particular, right now, uh, we're, we're working very closely with our, with our partners from Mexico on their minimum security as, as well. But some of the innovations that I think we, we can have, and this is one that you were responsible for, and it's paying dividends right now. One was what we called Aqualane, Advanced Qualified Unlading of authority. And that basically said that if a vessel was uh, operated by a CTPAT carrier going to a CTPAT operated terminal, that the, that vessel could immediately discharge cargo even before CBP met or cleared the vessel. And so we've applied that across all of the major seaports. And that is something that we're doing in Long Beach as a way of, of making certain that we are not an impediment to the discharge of that cargo. So, but other innovations that, we, that we're, we're tackling right now, besides technology, such as creating a new app that will allow our partners to access the CTPAT portal, are things such as, one, integrating e-commerce concepts into the CTPAT universe. E-commerce is a huge uh, disruptor in the nor normal supply chains, and the CTPAT program is working to catch up on that with re and, and be able to uh, have CTPAT partners that include um, fulfillment centers or, or warehouses or e-commerce platforms so that we can ensure that that package that gets bought by a consumer and is shipped directly to their house has the same supply chain security measures in place that a normal container going to a, a, a regular brick and mortar uh, retailer. And then the last thing that we're working on with the CTPAT program is the inclusion of standards for forced labor. Now, forced labor is, is, is a scourge around the globe. It's a terrible thing when, uh, when, whether it's child labor or slave labor or other forms of forced labor are used to produce products. Products that are produced by forced labor are expressly prohibited from entry into the United States. And we have a huge regime within CBP to try to protect uh, our economy from these types of products. And so working with the CTPAT universe of partners, it's one of the other things that we're working on is in making certain that we have appropriate standards around forced labor. That's terrific. And I'm, um, I'm very proud that um, some of the work we started together is really coming to fruition currently. Um, it was a good effort and it's really uh, noble work that that program does. Um, so our, our next panelist is Assistant Commissioner Sonny Bagwalia. And, and for you, I have some questions really as it relates to, um, uh, you know, kind of the mission set at CBP, it's so enormous. And I'm sure that there's a constant demand from your operators for innovation and the infusion of technologies into their mission set to improve targeting, processing, mobility, even communication in, in terms of um, some of the, the component offices. So I'm hoping that you can sort of highlight for me what, what are some of the significant markers of success to move CBP forward and, and to support all of this innovation that you've been able to accomplish, like, for example, in the past five years. Yeah, and so again, I've, I've been here uh, 
you know, three years, 10 months or so. So, uh, but those are CVP years, as we all know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I've been 36 years overall uh, doing this uh, and, you know, as a department CIO twice and and, uh, and another three times in, in state government and other federal government agencies. I'll say that there's tremendous progress that we've made and there have been a lot of challenges, but uh, this is like a couple of Fortune 20 companies running operations at that scale every day you know, in, in, in government uh, terms, and it's, it's been tremendous. Uh, so I, I, before I do that, I just, I just want to just set a context. So our mission is protect the American people, safeguard our borders, and enhance the nation's economic prosperity. While we're doing that, this past, just let's say year, year and a half, we've had the largest global pandemic that we've dealt with and operated seamlessly, 24-7, remote, no problem largest uh, agency to do that in terms of uh, law enforcement agency in the United States. And, you know, we did that uh, while still some people were on the front lines, you know, so, I mean, you know, there's a combination there, but it's tremendous. We did a 21 year border search at that level and we handled that. We did the largest airlift in history, Operation Allies Welcome and Refuge. We also withstood the largest cyber attempt, uh, you know, and then we were not affected by that uh, in CBP. And then while we did that, you know, and as, as we had uh, travel uh, numbers and fee collection shortages, budget shortfalls, and yet the mission continued. And if you look at some of the metrics that Tom talked about in the fiscal year, over 2.8 trillion in total goods value process through ACE, for example, through our systems. As CIO, you know, that's, that's amazing. But it's really working with our trusted partners like Tom and others who really make that happen. So I think that's a big thing that we have done. There's a lot more close knit relationship and partnership so that the trusted partners mission leads the way and technology is with them. We did over 367 billion in cost savings realized through CBP and trade stakeholders through streamlined processing of ACE capabilities. You know, over 123 billion in duties assessed through trade remedy enforcement section 201, 232 and 301. Uh, Tom mentioned uh, over 84 billion. I believe Tom, I don't know the nearest number is it says you're 96 billion. I don't know if that's correct, but that's what our team says. That's the largest ever we've ever done in duties, fees, taxes, anti-dumping duty, and countervailing duty collected through ACE, which is the second largest agency next to IRS, and I was CIO of Treasury before, so that's pretty impressive. Uh, and so when we're processing all these, uh, you know, commercial import, about 368 million commercial import cargo entries, if you look at these numbers, I think Liz, and you know this, of course, but I'm just saying, it's quite staggering what's being done here. And that is one part of the mission trade. Then you look at travel and, you know, even the number we used to process 1.2 million passengers a day, uh, you know, it, it still it's 650,000, but still it's all picking back up, as Tom mentioned. And while we're doing all of this stuff, uh, you know, uh, I think CBP has really focused on mission applications, deploying, you know, 40 teams deploying capabilities every two weeks or less. Uh, you know, and, and then working with the stakeholders like Tom and others to make sure these get deployed. Mission infrastructure, we are ahead of moving to the cloud to make it more resilient. We are at 45% of migration in that area. We've also uh, looked at these trusted partnerships, like I said, really improved uh, trade, travel, everything, border, you know, working together. Uh, cybersecurity, uh, we process, uh, so there are about 40 billion data exchanges every day from a CIO standpoint that we support in the mission. But there are also 40 million uh, cyber attempts every day. <laughs> so, and and uh, just to let you know, you know, that's why I have gray hair now. You know, uh, used to. So, uh, you know, and and so anyway, we are processing them in touch wood. Uh, you know, we've withstood that. Uh, we are also uh, looking at making sure there's governance of the portfolio so that we can account for transparency. We were lucky enough to be the second agency ever to win a cost transparency award on TBM which the White House has done. So my point is on all of these things, and then finally, of course, we take care of our people. I think the people have been incredibly resilient. If I just look at the supply chain challenges and cargo issues, if I could just frame it in three parts real quick. One is on the legacy, the challenges would be on the legacy cargo manifest infrastructure with the impact of COVID and global health crisis and e-commerce and other importing, exporting, it's been a critical driver. The cargo manifest system has seen a rapid increase in e-commerce and the volume of e-commerce is increasing, but it's, it's resulting in a negative impact to the US and trade community uh, due to the aging legacy infrastructure that's struggling to keep up with this increased volume. The volume is tremendous. Uh, and, and we are leveraging a lot of cloud and other kinds of services, and we gotta be at scale. Again, remember I talked about Fortune 20 companies, a couple of Fortune 20 companies at scale. And I've also been a chief engineer in a Fortune 20 company, so I can tell you this is pretty impressive what uh, is being done here. 
So it's imperative that the U.S. the system processing and the valuable cargo, uh, you know, in the supply chain re re remains resilient and reliable. And any delays in the processing, you know, the manifest uh, directly relates to delays in the ability of the government to import uh, to vital cargo, you know, uh, that's affecting that. So the ports of the future is something that Tom talked about. And so we have a lot of robust capabilities that we're doing. Uh, I say one of the challenges, of course, is budget cuts. Uh, I can't go without saying that due to fee collection and others, we've all had the competing priorities. And I think uh, uh, between the cut that we did in FY20 and 21, there's going to be quite a few challenges. So we are using things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and and we got cybersecurity uh, uh, enhancements that we got to do. So all of this stuff, we try to balance. And these are challenges that we're looking at. But I think the overall picture, I'll just say, is I'm continually amazed and proud of how much CBP has been able to do. An incredible, incredible job. Uh, it, one of the best, uh, if not the best, agencies in terms of what we're achieving. And just, uh, just really proud to be part of the team. Sir, I, I couldn't agree more. I do have one question for you, though. Port infrastructure itself is a challenge at all of the ports of entry. Land and yes. So the recent bill that was passed by Congress will provide many ports the opportunity to redesign and upgrade their infrastructure, both physical and technical. So as CBP's chief technology executive, what would be your priority messages to the ports in terms of investments they can make for sustainable innovation from CBP? Yeah, I think I think to, we need to enhance efficiencies at these maritime ports of entry, and I think that's really, really important. So I just five quick points. First is I think we need to fund and modernize the cargo manifest system so that the United, United States has a consistent, reliable ability to import and export critical goods quickly and safely. I think second would be we need richer data prior to reaching the port of entry so that we can gain some in-depth insight into the complete supply chain. Then we can implement a thorough and in-depth risk assessment prior to the goods arriving. Third, I think harmonized tra tariff schedule uh, classifications. Although I am not a per expert on this, I have experts who, who know this stuff inside, inside and out. And of course, uh, you know, working with our colleagues uh, like Tom and others, you know, I think uh, these some of these classifications from just data uh, uh, classification, the informal entries are hit and miss, are hit and miss. I think automating the ability to investigate these trends and the trade risks would be very important. Number four. I think CBP continues to de develop functionality using artificial intelligence, machine learning to derive these harmonized tariff schedule classification from text description of the goods in bills and lading or bills of lading and also entry documents. And that's important. By the way, I have about 40 artificial intelligence projects going on in CBP writ large and about 140 in robotic process automation. So if you can just give you a scale, this is just one of those. So that's what we're doing. I've deployed a center of excellence to allow everyone to fish. So it's not just the CIO's office doing it. The point is everyone should be able to do it as long as we can help them get it done. And the last area is uh, the, this assist uh, CVP. Uh, this effort will assist CVP and trade in reclassifying or classifying the de minimis shipments subject to oversight from PGA so that when this harmonized tariff schedule is not included in the electronic final by the trade community, you know, that can be sort of taken care of. And of course, COVID-19 has induced choke points in the ports of entry. So I think automating operations well ahead of the arrival will reduce the dependencies on these ports of entry. So I think those are the five points that I would like to say, but uh, working in partnership, like you said, with others, I believe we can handle this. And as a country, we do need to handle this. So, so my last thought or question for you is, you know, everyone knows CVP is a behemoth in terms of data collection and data analysis becomes that critical component of making those good decisions. And so you did mention artificial intelligence and machine learning. And if, if you could sort of dive a little deeper, give us an example of something that you think would be kind of a critical um, introduction or innovation in terms of helping CBP make those decisions and then in any way that uh, it affects uh, the supply chain, of course. Yeah, absolutely. But first of all, I got great teams. So first of all, we have great partners like Tom and others who absolutely support us. So I think uh, with him and Diak Sabatino and, and uh, ESC Highsmith, I mean, just I can just go on and on. Very, very important in sort of receiving that. And that's continually gone on from before and, and today and I think going into the future. Second, he's got a great staff, you know, technical uh, ranging from Tom Mills from Cargo to 
to our uh, you know partners with our CTO, my CTO, and my in my area and and others. So my point is, I think we got great staff as well. But really, the technologies is something that we're doing as centers of excellence. So let me give you a few examples. So first, we're doing robotic process automation. So I said we got about 140 of these things going on, and we're allowing everyone to kind of work together, but within a certain structure and registry. So robotic process automation, we're optimizing RPA processes so that we can streamline the workflows. It's not just about technology. Technology only automates an inefficient process faster. So you got to get the workflow also uh, optimized, right? Sorry, that was my that was my little joke. But uh, <laughs> anyway, but but uh, but uh, you know, CIOs can also be pretty humorous at times. Anyway, but the point is to streamline these workflows and allow us to be more profitable, flexible, and responsive within the program. So. What we're doing is we're optimizing this RPA so that we are non-invasive, rapid, and accelerated digital transformation, resulting in time savings mainly and maybe some cost. So two examples. One first, we have a duty deferral bot. So these bot, this bot can help alleviate the financial strain. We've satisfied sort of the president's executive order for this 90-day duty deferral for those importers finding financial hardship due to COVID-19. So at the onset of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, damage importer financial streams and importers suffer delays in sort of uh, product sourcing, international sh uh, shipping and receiving and payments. And so this duty deferral bot streamlined the duty deferral process by authorizing deferral from duty payments on shipments without delaying the entries. We did over 50,000 of the electronic entry documents th that would have required inspection to verify eligibility and the bot removed the need for the arduous human intervention and errors. So that's pretty good. So that means good software code, working to help you out and not replacing humans but working and supporting humans you know work well right because we've got plenty of things to do another example is the ace uh, automated commercial environment ace quota high low uh, proration tuna bot uh, i love tuna myself but uh, anyway so this tuna bot is is really interesting so this one was done with uh with in partnership with our other trade partners and they sort of did the work along with us and others you know working together and so again, my point is CIO doesn't have to solve everything. You know, we work in conjunction with others. Everyone's smart enough, and that's the idea. Empower, and that becomes a force multiplier. So in 2021, there were 1,067 high-duty tuna HTS lines were duplicated and adjusted by the bot. So it covered a total of about 18.3 million kilograms of tuna and provided a significant labor savings at the Agriculture and Prepared Product Center, APP Center. The trade partners benefited from nearly 5.6 million in reduced duties from the program with over 10.7 million in duties being reduced to over 5.1 million. So the tuna bot saved the quota and agriculture branch and the app center about 14,300 tedious manual data entry keystrokes in 2021, eliminated human errors, saved the US government $20,000 in interest, and provided refunds to the trade community months earlier than normal by uh, enabling qualified entry summaries to be processed without delay. So I, I think those two examples give you the robotic process automation. That's awesome. Another thing, and another thing we're doing in data analytics, but we didn't stop there. We also did some data analytics because it's all about data now. Everything is about data. Everyone wants answers now. So data is only as good as the programs and everything else that you can define and how you work together with that. So again, the CIO's office remains in support and again, with good, great leaders like Tom and others who are leading the way and all our mission stakeholders, uh, we continue to look at analytics and machine learning because AI only works with good data. That's really a key point. I'm an engineer by training and I've done a lot of data and other projects in my life successfully, but you know, it's all about the data and the business process as well. So I do understand that really well. So as the global trade volume has increased, the complexities presented in the trade environment has increased, we are trying to respond with a more proactive risk management posture by not only strategic and tactical, but looking at where the resources are the highest risk, and then, and then looking at trying to still facilitate lawful you know, uh, and compliant trade, but look at analytics to do that. So for example, we did the recent trade related efforts at examining section 321, uh, compliance and ADCBD and product safety. We we continue to look at analytics, ingest, data ingestion and integration platform. Uh, so this is a cloud-based platform, data platform, and we're using cloud services, providing zero downtime deployment of capabilities, rapid ingestion of data, and highly scalable sto storage uh, to meet sort of data storage needs of trade analytics. So I think the cloud is another big thing that we've done. And as I mentioned before, 
we were supposed to be at 32 percent for overall uh, ma uh, migration of 270 applications for the entire enterprise we're already at 45 percent so ahead of schedule you know, that's the good news uh, again funding a little bit of a challenge but we're working through it so this platform will provide real-time descriptive diagnostic predictive and prescriptive analytics both tactical and strategic so we can set that up working with our partners so this platform we will allow us to have a dashboard for section 321 to support office of trade and field operations uh, both offices can then look at potential violations related to the de minimis on section 321 we can have uh, sort of uh, carrier report cards to track uh, primary violators and quantities of violation and how they're shared with the you know the violative uh, uh, trade partners to aid compliance and ace portal is going towards an account based interaction so that you can have a customer related crm practice instead of transaction by transaction we're also redesigning the legacy ace portal uh, for a new user interface uh, that allow accounts and support applications uh, for entry processing uh, stay tuned there's some new stuff going to be announced as you uh, as you enter the new year i shall leave that as a little hanging little <laughs> thing out there so that you, know, you all will come excited a little teaser for preview yeah. of attractions preview of attractions to come uh my team has been working very hard with our teams here and then we're also putting some new capability that will give vessel agents and owner operators the ability to log into the ace portal launch the mobile collection receipts application to pay fees online enable automated clearance and will allow the vessel masters agents operating carriers to submit data to CBP for the entrance and clearance system VEX housed in ATS. By the way, that's also part of the uh, White House uh, uh, Evidence Act and all the new digital stuff that they're doing with uh, you know customer uh, experience. And lastly, I'll just say that we're also looking at other technologies into cargo processing. We're looking at digital twins and interoperability. So digital twins twin is when you have a virtual representation of a physical object. So you can look at incorporate information about the object's physical location and entries, controlling it throughout the supply chain. And so this technology can provide a complete supply chain transparency for government and private entities as the products make their way into the United States. The last thing is interoperability. We're focusing on interoperability so that members of the trade community can communicate with the government utilizing sort of royalty free standards. So these standards allow the private sector business to choose their technology platforms, including exchange data, legacy systems, blockchain, distributed ledger, and future systems. I'm sorry, I'm going into the sort of technology speak, but uh, you know we're all there, and I think our investment in this interoperability has demonstrated some exciting results to expedite cargo processing, increase the supply chain transparency, and operate uh, at higher speed, com, com speeds, and also in, in support enhanced security. And let me just close by saying this one thing. There's also a need for operational technology and information technology. So in addition, I do information technology. You know, Tom also has to look at operational technology. You know, so the, so there's a need for operational technology to have a backhaul of data on the back end to work with information technology, the cyber security of it, the data storage of it, the cloud and the network movement of it. All of that lifecycle management of it is really important. So how do we correlate that operational technology into the electronic filing using like the ACE for automated uh, sort of uh, release of goods, you know, that whole process that Tom talked about is really important. So sorry, I've said a lot, but I'll just say that it's really exciting to work with, uh, uh, you know, folks like Tom and uh, the ex Abatino and uh, Trade and all our partners. And some of the work that's going on in CBP is absolutely leading edge, uh, and and it's uh, certainly honored to be the CIO and uh, been supporting this for all this time. Thank you. Oh, AC, I'm thank you so much. You gave us so so much information, and I'm I'm so excited. Actually, a lot of the language that you said I know as a former import specialist, so it it makes me very happy to see all of that progress, and uh, makes me a little homesick. I'm not gonna lie. So um, thank you so much. So moving on to Cameron Sherry from um, Dell Technologies. I have a couple questions for you. I hope we're doing okay on time, but um, I, I, this one I think is really important for us to know because given what the CBP executives have shared with us today and, in, and the close collaboration that Dell and CBP has had over the years, um, what do you see as um, you know, the, the industry partner 
uh, with the government can add value to the efforts like the Port of the Future and things like they're doing with, um, you know, AC Bagwalia just mentioned about artificial intelligence and machine learning. But it's important, I know, for CBP to get technology in the field as close to the mission as possible. So um, I'm happy to hear your thoughts. Yeah, Liz, thank you. And I'll tell you, uh, it's very difficult to follow up AC Bagwalia like that. What a brilliant a set of commentary there. But I think if we if we pull a few threads that Sonny put out there, I think they're really, really important. Um, we try and bring a lot of the capabilities and technologies out to the relevant mission edge. You know, Sonny and um, Mr. Over, uh, Acker talked a lot about where the mission really hits the ports and where we're starting to do that from a maritime perspective or even from a land perspective. Where we're really focused is in that critical intersection point that Sonny mentioned. Look, you know, 5G, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, the Internet of Things, these are more than just acronyms and buzzwords. We're starting to see very practical, um, kinetic opportunities and use cases. Things like how we outfit IoT devices at the port so that as you're reading cargo that's coming through, applying artificial intelligence and machine learning, it really results in, Liz, about expanding the human potential and I love what Sonny said about this, right? The, the robots, um, the, the RPA robots, the application of artificial intelligence, it is not meant to replace the human in the chain. It's meant to expand the human's opportunity, remove the quote unquote noise off the wire a little bit so that when it comes down to mission execution, we're getting the human intervention at the point of mission relevance and mission need. And that is vital, especially when you look at the critical importance of the CBP mission globally, right? So where we're focused is not only in that private-public partnership that, that both Mr. Overacker and Sonny mentioned, but it's about participating in that, right? We are one of the largest global supply chain companies out there, right? With our uh, integration, we now are the largest uh, consumer of microelectronics on the planet. So being able to leverage our data in a partnership with Sunny and the rest to be able to bring that to bear to create a trusted supply system is vitally important because when you have those trusted suppliers, you can then focus on the ones that you really need to focus on, the tier two, the tier three, the things that are coming into the states that may be questionable or need further inspection. But he also mentioned an interesting point, which is the intersection of IT and OT. Because when you begin to bring those two technological areas together, the data explosion and expansion is almost uh, incomprehensible. And Sonny mentioned cloud. Cloud is a great opportunity. What I would offer you is it's more than a destination. It's an operating model, right? Sonny is able to take advantage of the current destinations. But imagine and envision a world where we're doing this now um, more on the DOD side and the intelligence community side but where you have portable tactical clouds deployed actually on the cargo ships, pre-processing a lot of this information in as near real time as you can get, when you can either get a SATCOM link or some other sort of communication link available, whether it be 5G uh, or any other type of telecommunication device, we can now pre-authorize, pre-communicate incoming opportunities before a ship even gets in range. So it's this whole host of opportunities to bring these two worlds together. And then Sonny mentioned something again, very powerful and important using AI and machine learning. I can now predict and pre-stage where I need people, machinery at the ports itself. So when we talk about port efficiency, we're optimizing to an ultimate level that redefines how ports work today. Um, Look, I humbly grew up in the Port of Baltimore. Uh, I also worked at Bethlehem Steel, so I understand kinetically what these things mean. And um, it is, I agree with Sonny, it's extraordinarily exciting to be able to leverage the data at mission speed to be able to have a very positive impact. And there's some things Sonny didn't directly mention overtly, but I want to mention because I think CBP in the civilian market space probably is the exemplar of excellence in this. And it's this iterative, agile application development capability to be able to deploy new capabilities safely, first and foremost, because cyber resiliency is critical in today's world. But 
uh, efficiently and effectively. And those cost savings you talked about, I'm excited because I see more coming, right? I see this efficient deployment of technology being used <clears throat> to do what it's supposed to do, create the information data stream that allows decision makers to make better decisions. Um, I agree with you, by the way, and I think I think more is coming in that regard, especially in terms of being able to readjust the tariff rates on things uh, in that whole trade space. It's just enormous. But I recently saw you discuss um, supply chain risk management as it relates to zero trust computing. Um, so I did a little research on all of you before you got here. And um, I wanted to ask you to give our audience today a sense of what that looks like in the future and how you think it meets the needs for cybersecurity. Yeah, great question, Liz, thank you. Um, look, there's, there's a loose coupling of, of cap or relationship here. Zero trust, as we know, I think is, is well overdue in its need. And it really is about a, a radical change of thinking on how we look at cybersecurity and updating our thinking, the conventional wisdom um, with regards to, you know, trust nothing on the network versus what we used to do in DevOps cycles, open up everything with administrative privilege, then figure out how to close everything down. Where I like to focus, because we recognize clearly that cyber is a risk before technology is even born. It comes down into the risk in supply chain, gray market injection, anything that can happen to silicon while in transit. So for us at Dell Technologies, we, we look at how do we protect the sovereignty of the U.S. supply chain from a microelectronics perspective? Um, because we know that other nefarious things can happen. You get things pre-assembled in certain TAA viable countries, uh, and sometimes there can be kinetic operations that occur there that, that are um, unknown to the government prior to even operationalizing the technology to create these great capabilities that Sonny and Mr. Everacker and all of us are talking about. So we think it's vitally, vitally important that you have to focus on supply chain integrity and resiliency. I'll give you one quick fact as an example is, right, when we uh, first recognized the world was shutting down due to this, you know, horrific pandemic we've all experienced, uh, and happened in March, you know, of, of last year, by April, we were back to 90% manufacturing capability. It took us less than six weeks. There was one factory we couldn't get online because the import-export challenges for the cleaning chemicals were a little difficult, but 90% manufacturing. And that is to create the resiliency that, that Sonny and Mr. Overackers talked about so that our economies can keep moving forward. So that supply, it's all due to our risk management strategy, where you stage things globally, who you import from, all those types of things I think are vitally critical before we get to operational technologies to protect them from a cyber perspective. Thank you so much, Cameron. That was a very, um, very. I think we could talk a lot longer about all of this <laughs> stuff for sure. So I think we have a couple of minutes left and I apologize, um, but I'm happy to introduce Adam Clater, who is the chief architect for Red Hat. And Adam, I have some uh, questions for you. But um, one of the things I, I did um, want to talk about was there's, there is a, a tremendous need for more accurate processing of goods, obviously, entering the United States and putting accurate information at the fingertips of our operators so that they can make not only the right decision, but with precision and efficiency. And how do you see the integration? And Sunny, um, I apologize, AC Bagualia, the... Uh, mentioned artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I'm eager to hear what you think in terms of what Red Hat has, you know, kind of in the back of their mind about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, Sonny made a lot of really important points. Uh, and he actually spoke about tuna, which I found is interesting. Do you, uh, you know the difference between AI and fish? You may not. You can tune your AI, but you can't tune a fish. You guys can use that. Okay. Um, but the, the, <laughs> <laughs> Sonny, I, I, had to, I had to follow up with your good jokes. I hope you appreciated that one. Um, so the point, though, is that we have a real opportunity with AI to draw some interesting conclusions from all of this data, because that's what everybody's been talking about so much. So we want to collect all this data. Data is really the cornerstone of, our, of the operations there at CBP. And so it's important that we be able to draw these conclusions. But imagine when you are, have the ability to start correlating uh, the facial recognition of the driver operator 
with the RFID that you're scanning off of the container, cross-referencing that with the license plate that we've got the automated scanning of. We know who owns that truck. We know who's driving that truck. We know where that truck has been coming from. Maybe we know the weight and the contents of that truck. There's a lot of anomalies that we can start to extract from all of that. What if we've got a truck being operated by a different driver one day? What if we've got a driver operating uh, for a, a company he never worked for before? We can start to find anomalies at the port all over the place by looking at all of this data and getting really deeply into that data. But it does take a lot of tuning of that AI uh, to get back to my earlier point. And so I think the maturity of our data, the cleanliness of our data, is, as uh, AC already mentioned there, that's going to be really, really important. The other thing that becomes important is the integration of all of that data. Because, and I'm sure, Sonny, you've seen this time and time again, I've got data in one place, but my applications can't figure out how to talk to that data. Or I've got a data in a silo somewhere where I can't expose it to all the places where it needs to be. And so at Red Hat, we've got a lot of focus on that data integration topic as well. And how do we expose the data in ways that are going to be very natural to our developers in order to be able uh, to consume them? Because one thing that may not be very well appreciated is there's a hard stop in development when I can't figure out how to access or integrate with the data. So being able to expose the data and get access to our developers is a cornerstone of the agile development processes that have already been spoken about in all this. So we've got the data integration problem, we've got the data normalization problem, and then finally, the distributed processing. If you've been paying attention to technology news the last couple of days, uh, we've had some cloud type issues going on uh, in, in the world. And so the reality is uh, all of us find ourselves in a hybrid or a multi-cloud deployment model where we can't always depend on just one cloud. Now, sometimes that might be because we're operating at a border where we've got limited connectivity, right? Sometimes that may be because we're operating on a ship where we've got limited connectivity, or sometimes it may be that our provider has simply gone down. And so a big focus for us at Red Hat is how do we take all of that technology that we've been able to build in the data center, work with a great technology partner like Dell, package all of that up, and then deliver it so that it can live in the back of a suburban, or it can live on a container or in a ship somewhere where that data needs to be so that we don't experience these interruptions to service simply because we've had an issue in our cloud environment. So that's an important part of how we think about disaster recovery and continuity of operations. In fact, we see this at the airports as well, right? We've got that same problem where every organization and every, every vessel, every truck, every port of entry, whether that be air, ground, or sea, these are all going to become small data centers. And these data centers need to be able to operate in that disconnected way if we're going to have that continuity of operations. So I think that becomes a really important part of our planning and execution. So um, Adam, thank you for that. And I did um, some research on you as well. And I saw a, a bit of a video that you did talking about IT modernization. And um, I wanted to give you the opportunity to speak about software as a service. And uh, it was an interesting, it was very short, but it was a very interesting conversation. And and connect that for me or not with um, kind of this concept of ports of the future, not just as it relates to CBP, but maybe the, you know, the ports themselves. Yep, um, absolutely. absolutely. I think we so, have like two minutes left. I know, and I want to I be conscious of that because we've got uh, a handful of questions and I want to make sure that they've got an opportunity to be addressed as well. So I'll, I'll be tight with this, but I think that, you know, every organization is now finding themselves and every CIO is finding themselves in the business of building software and building clouds and delivering technology. As we think about building these technologies and making them available, uh, software as a service is the de facto model for making them, uh, for bringing them out uh, and bring, making them prominent within our, that ability. What's super interesting about all of this is that if we think of, um, if we think of all of the bits of software as a service and all of the, the APIs that we're developing within the organization, that becomes a rich palette for our application developers to then build new features, functionality, and technology upon. So it's vitally important that we be looking at things like software as a service, but also our internal APIs that we're able to build out in order to use those to expose all of that data that's so important 
in a normalized way across the enterprise. So I'll leave it there because I, I do want to make sure I give you enough time to, to get to your questions because uh, I know that, that they're important to all of our guests. We had a couple of questions that were kind of, I'm going to try to bunch them together, but about industry government collaboration, and what's the best way to share new ideas and, and, and such with government as an, as an industry and um, sort of the, the, the emerging capabilities that, that you all are looking for at CBP. What are some of the the uh, the new capabilities that you're considering and you'd like to you'd like industries help to, to start to build for so uh, if you wouldn't mind just kind of try to wrap a few thoughts around there and 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 uh, go around the the horn with some last thoughts I, it, that would be terrific so I, I think the one thing I'd, I'd like to say when we talked about the port of the future and how we're using technology there to have a fully integrated platform you know one of the things you know that we know is that this technology already exists, whether it's the, the advancements that we've seen in non-intrusive inspection equipment, you know, and all these other forms that we're trying to link together, uh, the technology exists, but the biggest challenge for us is the integration piece. How do we get all of those things integrated together in a seamless platform? And also as Sunny talked about artificial intelligence, you know, applying anomaly detection to that problem set so that when we have a Toyota Corolla go through the port, we already know what a Toyota Corolla looks like. And we and the machine can tell us there's something, there's something amiss here. So, you know, and focus that officer's attention to where it needs to be. So to me, that's the next part of this, is how we can seamlessly integrate all of these existing technologies, but in a way that is meaningful to the officer at the port of entry. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think it's all about the data. And I think as we get use the data with context to become information, with experience become knowledge, we got to bring that to the fingertips so that the agent or officer out in the front line can see it, make a quick decision based on any, some intelligence and, and other things that puts it together and makes it available so they can go past go. And some of the things that I was talking about, these historic events that we did, we are adjudicating this millions of levels of things that I'm doing, talking about in, in two seconds <laughs> within a whole cyber tick structure and all this other stuff, ad volume, either you know green or red. And then, and then but be, behind that, there's a lot of work that's being done before something like that can happen. And so I think that requires partnerships. It requires a lot more in data. And I think there's a lot there to take data into information. And I think to me, with the mobility and making that available at people's fingertips at the speed of mission 24 seven is going to be the future on everything that we do. And that'll require partnerships, not only with what we have in CBP, across government, other government agencies, all our industry partners, and then also the 80 countries or more countries and the five I countries. I think all of that is what I'm talking about there. And I think I'll just last thing I'll say is someone asked a question about uh, uh, how do you get with business? With the CBP, uh, there's a, a website on, on cbp.gov that allows you to do business connection, register equity and process, and then we process meeting with you. And of course, uh, stay tuned for uh, you know uh, Commerce Business Daily and all the other sort of uh, uh, things that we put out there for uh, RFPs and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think Liz, one of the great things that we started to allude to, uh, you know, in the, the world we see today geopolitically, uh, a lot, our government takes a lot of hits, but you, we really have to celebrate what our civil servants and our people in DOD do every single day to protect our country from threat. And I think one of the things that we can continue to always improve um, is the not invented here. Culturally, we need to change and we need to break that silo down and just completely do away with it. I think our government does a good job. We need to do a better job of leveraging the R&D that industry already invests into, right? As an example, we invest almost $8 billion in the last two years in R&D and technology. If you went out to Silicon Valley and just drove down a five square mile radius, you could leverage almost $100 billion of R&D. And that's not budget the government's got to set aside. Thanks. All the government has to say is that looks really cool and give me a demand signal and industry kicks in. We've got something greater in the U.S. that no one else has, and that is our economy, our GDP, and our American spirit. I think once we leverage that further in this partnership with government, we could do some extraordinary things. Yeah, just to, just to finish up, I think, I think Tom and Sonny really hit the nail on the head. And I think when we talk about some of that anomaly detection, 
Um, but we can also do some interesting decision-based management. We can make some decisions. We can do some interesting scoring of things because not everything is black and white in this world. Uh, we need to say, well, this, this is a percentage of this and this is a percentage of that. Uh, and then we can bring a human into the loop and all of that decision-making if we need to. But as Sonny said, we're making so many of these decisions in an automated way, and I think we need to continue to do that. I think it's amazing progress. I think you guys have done a great job with it. And uh, Red Hat, we're just happy to be partnered with you and, and working with you on it. So thank you. I just want to thank you guys uh, for today. I'm grateful uh, for your, your partnership in this event.